everyone. Um, my name is Maciek. I'm very pleased that you and came here. Um, for the last three years, uh, like uh, you could probably see me sitting somewhere there and, and writing in the notebook. Um, me and Lydia, we are probably calm guests here in Georgia. Um, so the reason why I was doing it was because um, in 2019 I decided to, uh, to write a novel, but also quickly after that the pandemic happened. I hope it wasn't connected in any way. Um, and uh, in and I, I started working from home, and then I thought that uh, I need some way to like cut, make have a cut between my work and, and actually writing. And coming here, that's why you're also in 2019, something that we are on the online 2019. Uh, then I, I thought that, okay, I could come here, uh, drink a beer, possibly not too much, and, <laughs> uh, and write. And it, uh, it uh, turned out to be a very good decision. I was really able to, to focus on, on writing instead of uh, everything that is going on when you're at home and you have like a computer next to you. And uh, also, um, it turned out that it's a good idea to write something by hand and then go home and uh, like rewrite it on computer or in cool changes. So I, I guess the quality of the text is, is quite OK. Um, yeah, and my handwriting got better. Yeah, uh, we are from Poland, um, from two different places, but we met in Warsaw. We lived close to Warsaw for some time, and in 2017, I got a job in Berlin, so we moved. Maybe I got a job in Berlin as well later. And uh, so the book uh, is written in Polish. If I never ever get a publisher in Poland, which is not such a big country, and it's possible that I won't get it, uh, <laughs> then I will invest in translating because really, like the three years of working on something, I think it's uh, like, it shouldn't be wasted. Which is like I will try not to waste it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, something else. No, that's that's all on this slide. Uh, my uh, my background when it comes to writing from the top left corner. Uh, before I started writing the the novel, um, I was uh, running a blog uh, with about history and uh, uh, the language of France. Um, so it, it started in 2015. I got some 100 entries uh, until uh, 2019, and then I thought, okay, I I want this. So the blog is currently on. Atlas, like you know, you just taking some virtual dust, and uh, I'm on the time of telling Lydia that I will come back to it. Um, so I hope I will. And uh, the other thing on the right here, this is a story I published before that in 2013, uh, 2012, I think. Um, it's uh, the name in English would be Red Will Be My Color, and it's like a red riding hood with werewolves in early Middle Ages. Yes, that's it. Um, and also uh, the one on the on the bottom left is uh, that um, even before that, in the 90s, when I was a teenager, uh, me and a group of my friends, we were writing like tons of very bad topics in our anime, mostly about Sailor Moon. Like cyberpunk, Silo Moon, science fiction, Silo Moon, Pantak, Silo Moon, everything. Uh, so that was also for me like a training ground because uh, when I started to write something more um, serious, I discovered that I actually, like, okay, I, I can do it. Like, uh, people uh, reading it generally thought that it's kind of good, I don't know, but they, they can't talk to me. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm also, uh, I also have a, a YouTube channel, uh, but this is about programming and teaching programming. So if you if you want to talk about it, and also please, ah, okay. Um, if you have a question uh, about not about the book, then, then please raise your hand and ask. If you have a, uh, and later we can just um, sit and talk up, uh, and, uh, and uh, you can ask other questions as well. So no problem there. Um, yeah. Uh, my inspiration, I think the, the, my main inspiration, my guru in, in fantasy world is Ursula Le Guin, uh, that lady, not, not that one. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, Ursula was a professor of anthropology and a 
and she was probably the most uh, famous in the fantasy uh, subculture in that she was all the time claiming that she doesn't uh, write fantasy, uh, but yeah. some, some sort of thought experiments about different worlds. Um, so she, because she wrote a completely non-fantasy series, FC, about the dragons and magic. And, uh, and, but, okay, there is a big difference about that because, mm, uh, from the other fantasy, in that he, uh, her stories about the dragons and magic are usually about people getting old and uh, sad because of getting old, or people about thinking about having children or not having children, or people who wanted to be powerful but then decided that it doesn't matter if they are powerful, they want to be happy instead. And um, so it is a different like way of looking at fantasy, I think maybe from the point of view of someone older than, than usually. Um, and the other, probably even more important part of her work were the science fiction series, uh, which is like a, there was a, like a good, I don't know, 10 maybe, or something about it, uh, a sequence of books which are loosely connected, but they are taking place in the same science fiction world. Uh, one of the most popular of them is The Left Hand of Darkness, um, about uh, like an Arctic world, where, and generally not only this book but all her books like that, are about how society can develop differently because of some biological uh, factors, about the differences in in, uh, in ecology, in sexuality, and stuff like that. And I thought that I would like to write something like this as well. So I don't want to have uh, dragons, and I don't want to have magic. But I want to have like a um, society on a different world where I can think uh, what is what can go differently if the world is different. But what are the, the parts that are like a core of humanity? They will things that will be the same no matter what. It's pretty common also because I'm very interested in history and I see things like this all way like in, in history of all different civilizations in the world that there are, there are certain things that are the same whether we talk about Inca, uh, Babylonia, or China, or whatever. Um, yeah, so I am... Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, after some thinking, I uh, thought that I would uh, base my novel about the um, Great African Lakes, the cultures of uh, people living there. And of course, um, sadly, probably when we, when we think about this region, when we think about uh, the, uh, the genocide in Rwanda and about the war in Congo, and this, will, this is also like a, some sort of um, thing that um, is in my work, in, in my novel. Um, but I wanted to go also like, uh, to see something deeper in that. Because um, uh, just as we just as we know that there are uh, tribes who uh, fight, fight each other in Rwanda or in Congo, uh, the same thing happens all over the world between peoples that are closely like living close to each other. They have we, we can have similar languages, similar cultures, and still we can we can have that we want through centuries and generations. Um, to that point where we start to fight when, when one generation fights because of their grandparents. So this is the situation also like you know like in Poland and Germany we had a conflict going going through for a long long, long time. Um, so this is definitely not just something that happens in Africa. It's just something human. Um, and oh yeah no. Okay. Yeah, because I thought, okay, this is very, this is something something serious and something quite sad, and I want to give it a, like a good good part of the story to make it like this. But I think it's important to have like a to have a balance that it it doesn't it shouldn't be only a story about bad things happening to people because then at some point in the 
readers so can probably everyone because tired of the, the, the characters die and they are sad and they are suffering and so on. And uh, the light is not only that. So the other thing that I came up with at some point was an idea of a, a young warrior from a this prehistoric society, uh, like finding the remains of an um, astronaut. And he didn't even imagine that something like an astronaut may exist, so he doesn't know what he's looking at. And um, that idea, uh, I, I don't even know why I thought about it, but I, uh, I started to think, okay, so what can happen to make it happen? Like, how, how can uh, my story come from somewhere to this? And while I was uh, developing that, that story, because I think this is quite popular. Okay? When, when we try to develop a story, we have like a point somewhere that we want to have, like a scene, and we try to create try to create like a um, lines between those points. So we develop the world uh, around some scenes, some ideas that we, uh, we came up with out of nowhere. And um, so in the uh, in the uh, in the time I was uh, I was doing that, uh, also this evolved. Like there is really no astronaut anymore in my in my story, but there are some remains of uh, of an ancient civilization that was much more technologically advanced than the state of the world in my story, and the, my my characters. Discover that those remains, and also they like they don't know what it is. So I tried also to to, to use a part of the novel to get into their heads and uh, try to see and try to explain what they see through their eyes. So this is a very different world from from ours. And uh, yeah, let's put it here. And um, it's a it's a world of uh, like a, a Neolithic. Technology level, so there are no uh, no writing, uh, no maps, no uh, no wheel. Uh, many things that we take for granted, they they don't have it. They don't even think that there can be. So their way of uh, thinking about the world is also very different. One thing, one another point, like if you if you imagine a graph with those points and the, that the world is developing around those points, um, is uh, a green, green python, and this particular green python is called Shrek and he lives in a Warsaw Zoo. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's why, um, that's because uh, green pythons have this very uh, distinct uh, way, um, in the, in the way the scales on their heads are, uh, are made, like uh, something that is not really uh, organic, maybe something that looks that gives them a look of, of a robot. And I thought, okay, so maybe maybe those uh, snakes could be important for the people in my world, and they can be actually something like robots, maybe not exactly robots, but something like robots. But because people in my story don't know that, so they think that this is how it is, right? If you if that if you have something very very weird around you, but you have it for all your life, you think it's normal. So. Mm, so, uh, so yeah, the snakes are important for the like a mythology and the, um, and the religion uh, of those people, and because there is no writing, no written, the, the most of the way people talk about um, like the way they 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 keep telling the, the stories that they keep passing knowledge is the, when they talk about that uh, like around fire and. Uh, Make up also some myths and stories that are not really real, but you at some point you can um, and you will tell if your grandfather was telling you a story that is not just, just something that he made up, or is it really a story about uh, some real event from the past? Uh, yeah, so uh, Brian uh, asked me about the map anyway. I told him that there were no maps, but I made one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, my, my main issue with this is that uh, a map like that is, uh, in our minds, it's uh, pretty easy to connect it with, uh, with this epic fantasy like Lord of the Rings, where you, you should so probably have a dragon somewhere here. But, uh, <laughs> um, so this is really just um, 
uh, all the all the story is uh, taking place in a valley in the mountains. Uh, the around the mountains there is a desert, so nobody really uh, ever uh, crossed the desert and came back. Some people probably tried to cross, but they didn't come back. So um, so we don't and my characters also don't know where in the world they are, and that's not important for the story. So I just left it like that. Uh, it can be Earth, it can be another planet, it can be, I don't know, ancient past or some uh, some distant future, it just doesn't matter. And also that gave me like a way to shape my story that it really is like a 400 pages big book and that's no, nothing, there's no, nothing more, nothing, nothing before it, nothing after it. Um, there is, uh, there is like the central bigger uh, settlement. I would call it a city, but it would be like the only city and the first city in the whole village just to be just, uh, just created. Um, all the other places in the in the village are only in the valley are only small villages. The one uh, the, the valley is in is tropical, it's almost exactly at the equator. The sun comes up from the from the east, goes down um, uh, on the west, uh, there uh, almost exactly uh, between in the gap between uh, the mountains that the river is uh, flowing through. So this uh, small, smaller uh, village close to the gap is called uh, Farewell to the Sun, and uh, this is the name of the of the novel as well. Um, yeah. Uh, apart from that, they are. Uh, there's, they are agricultural people, but also they uh, they have cattle and cows are very important for their lives. Uh, also, they uh, they fish a lot, and this is like a I try to create like this ecologically uh, rational uh, society that is sustainable, but on a very low level. Like they they really try to be even if their religion they they try to be. Um, is minimalistic, careful about it because they know that some, somehow they know that if they if they use too much, then they can put it themselves. A catastrophe, which which sometimes they interpret in a different ways. For example, they do something wrong, and they, that can be absolute because because we know that absolute is not uh, a result of doing something bad to you. I don't know to the totem. But, but this is how uh, how people talked about such things in the past. Of our world as well. Um, yeah. Uh, what do we have? Here? Oh, about about the maps. Because we all we often like this is also something that I wanted to stress out that we think in a different way from them. Like in our world, we uh, are used to those uh, pretty much. Uh, um, Realistic maps with uh, that we know that to the cues is east, west, north, south. This is the, the size. Well, up uh, just like 500 kilometers east to west and 200 kilometers north north to the to, to south. And um, and this is not how people talk about about it in the past, really. Like uh, the two maps on the left, uh, these are maps of the land of Greenland. And they are only maps of the coast. You don't need to know what's inside Greenland because it's just frozen desert, nothing else. So what you are interested in when you are on the coast of Greenland is how it's shaped. So you, when you are a sailor and you come closer to the shore, you know that, OK, OK, so this looks like something up here. This looks like something there. So I'm in this place. And if I want to go to the settlement, it's in that direction. So what is important is the relation between you and other places, but not the exact shape of the, of the place. And in, in my world, if you can see, oh, no, I don't want to. Um, so if you if you can see, this is kind of shape a bit like this. And um, there is a scene in the book where one of the characters tells other. Others that there's like a there's a shortcut they can go from one end of the valley to the other, crossing the desert, and they um, this is done by showing them the bushel, 
uh, with bone is this part of the skeleton, which in uh, in birds is fused into one bone, which is shaped like like this letter B. And on the on this letter B, you can knot uh, some places. So this is not really looking good. This is not really the ballet. The ballet doesn't look like that. But it can also give you some idea about the relation relation between different places. And uh, this is a very heron, a uh, big uh, bird, which is on the, uh, on the in the valley and also in uh, the, you know, the region of Great African Lakes. And this is what we say is heron. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that so the, so this is a photo of the Congo River, and yeah, I some I think it's kind of. I talk about it that the Congo River could be like the, the river that flows through that through that valley, but it would be too big. Uh, so let's say okay, um, it's like a Congo River, but something somehow up upstream. And but I like this uh, this photo also because the the boats they use are probably the same boats that were used even thousands of years ago. There's just like a uh, there's only so many ways that you can make a canoe. Because, you know, in, in, especially in Neolithic, when you just have some simple tools, and this is also why I, love, why I like this level of technology. Because uh, even though um, the society can be developed in very different ways, if you only have uh, stone tools and uh, bones and wood and things like that, then there's only and then you have to be practical. And there's only like a, a certain things that practically works for. Uh, Technology. Um, yeah, and uh, these are um, Ettore Mazza is an artist who makes uh, graphics for uh, archaeological videos and uh, lovely stuff. I contacted him, he let me use a few of his uh, graphics. And uh, so, uh, originally, this is an impression of the first humans living 100,000 years ago. Or Earlier, I thought that it's a, like a good, like nice touch that I can use them as a sort of inspiration how uh, characters in my book may uh, look like, like connecting that. So I want to write something about the humanity as, as a whole, seeing things that are the same for all of us. Um, yeah, they live in mm, something like this. At least some of the, of the settlements are probably something like this. Except that there are no horses. Instead, you can imagine that there is one more cow. There should be many cows. And um, yeah, and they, they probably live in, in, in villages that are maybe 50 to 20, 50, 80 people, and uh, in tents with some stones in the foundations or in uh, uh, wooden huts or in. Uh, that was made from the white clay. Um, there is probably some field there, uh, and there is probably some pasture as well. And somewhere there behind the hill is another village like this. Um, yeah. Um, also, uh, it's um, it's not like people just uh, do one thing for a living. Like them, even though some of them may be. Uh, may have a couple and some other may uh, maybe farmers. It doesn't mean that there are no uh, no people like uh, even before Neolithic that uh, just uh, that that that, just, that are hunters. And one of at least one or two of my main uh, characters are hunters because it's like a way that I can move people around and uh, make them do things that are uh, interesting, more interesting than just digging. Um, and, or if you are, if it might be someone lives close to the river, then this is also based on the real stuff that we found um, in, in, in archaeology. <coughs> that uh, some of the uh, some of the huts were uh, built on the lakes and on the rivers. Probably that was even safer for people to live that like like that. And uh, and yeah, and uh, the stone, as I said before, the Neolithic tools were uh, 
mostly uh, mostly looked like like this. Uh, um, this is taken from beef cooking in Poland, but probably even in Africa or in other places in the world, the differences were so, were so big. Uh, the um, the knives were done from from stone, but also from uh, bones or from horns of cooking animals. Uh, this is a sickle. Um, this is a stone axe used to do. Uh, to cut down trees or cut down other people. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, how, is it, how is it in English? There were many, many, many ways to, uh, like the, the pottery was probably one of the first and most important um, discoveries of. Uh, uh, inventions of, of, of human beings, and there were many ways of doing it. And uh, we found, like, this is some, something that uh, students of archaeology are used for. They find uh, the like the broken pieces of all that uh, of all those uh, pots and uh, um, seeds, and they and students are used to put them all together. And, uh, and um, yeah, it's also an important part in my story because it's like a connection between the old way of doing things with some more more advanced technology. Um, and uh, on the fields, uh, I wanted to to tell something about about the field here as well. Uh, one of the, <laughs> one of the uh, of the most important uh, staple food um, for them is sorghum. It's kind of a grass, uh, so something like wheat or rye, but uh, look, looking a bit differently, but can be used in the very sim same way. And so one of the, those ways, probably most important, is to make some sort of uh, uh, wheat. Uh, wheat beer, let's say sorghum beer, um, no bubbles, uh, very hazy, and about two percent of alcohol. <laughs> and um, it is, but if, 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 you, if you really want, look, if you try hard, you can uh, drink a whole gourd of it, and uh, maybe you will, you will get dizzy. A gourd is actually uh, also, also an important thing because it's uh, it's a fruit. It's, uh, uh, it's a fruit that was probably domesticated even before the Neolithic times, even more than 10,000 years ago. And when it grows big, it becomes hard. You can hollow it, you can dry it, and then you get this very out top shell that can be used to store things. Like beef. Yeah, and that. that I think you wanted to say thing. something about the brewery in. Uh, that will be later. Uh, later? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. fine. But do we make a break now, or should I read? No. The uh, although maybe you have questions. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I personally like to hear it first, so I don't quite ask. Yeah, but you won't hear the whole book, right? Why? Well, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't even know what it's about. Other than the fantasy with no dragons and magic. In this <laughs> Yeah, so the, the rest of the, of the talk would be like a media reading that, that I'm seeing here, and then I would like to say something about the, the sources or the materials I used to, uh, and, and that's it. We also yeah. I have one question. And just like on the map, so you mentioned that people always said about that the, there's some method, people tried to you know cross the desert and no one ever came back. Mm -hmm. But did anybody ever go down the street? Uh, yeah, also the also the Okay. Oh, oh so you have a question. Oh, maybe this is like there is uh, like there is. Um, I don't want it to be too uh, like too naive. So I don't say just okay, nobody ever came back because they <laughs> went there and I don't know. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the only fertile land is within the valley. So if you go outside, you uh, you either go only as as far away as you can with with your uh, with, with food, and then you come back and you say, okay, that that looks just desert, and uh, or, or you don't so, because you went too far. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm very interested when you said that. So when is like one of your main uh, 
influences or like inspirations. Um, I know that she defined herself as doing as part of science fiction is that she always had her stories answering, or the way that she drafted her stories was to answer a what-if question, and that's how she always said that she sort of was science fiction and not necessarily yep. fantasy. I'm wondering if you had a what-if question for this or for this. I had something opposite, I think. I wanted to explore how, in a very different world, uh, our problems and conflicts can be the same. Like, uh, I wanted to also say something about the story itself a bit later, but it's basically how, even though the world is very different, uh, we can still have very, like, uh, problems that we also have right now in, in our world. It's like holding up. Two pigs. 
where the harvest was already over and where Kelvi were just as poor as everywhere. At the edge of the village, an old warrior, Heloa, lived in a small hut with a leaky roof. He was one of those who spent their days remembering the old times because present was for him just a series of the same events over and over spent in waiting for them. His main source of income was eggs from his hands and the beer he brewed. Noah offered to repair the roof for him in exchange for meal and the bed. The old man replied that uh, he could repair the roof himself, thank you very much, but Noah uh, could dig a trench around his hut and his hen house to keep the water from pouring when it rains. It was much harder work than patching the roof, but Noah didn't complain. There were the hot these were the hottest days of the year, and Noah spent one of them with his back bent, a hoe in his hand, digging a trench around the hut that stank of chicken and yeast, listening to stories about the old war which the old man was full of. He himself tried not to say it much. Yes, he fought in the war, in the mountains, to the south, far away from here. He took part in, in several skirmishes. Nothing big. He preferred to listen. And the old warrior was very pleased with this. Every now and then, the other Kelvi came to the village to watch. They nodded, commented uh, that it was well done, and then went back. Nobody helped him, but Noah did not expect it any, anyway. When the trench was over, um, almost finished and the sun was leaning towards the mountain peaks to the west, the old man lit a small fire in front of the main hut and cooked a gun, then disappeared into the hut for a while and returned with two bowls and a gourd of beer. The beer had a consistency of a soup. Noah did like beer. He didn't like soup. Um, in his memories, he associated soup with grits his mother tortured him with when he was five, fell over, kicked out uh, all of his baby front teeth at once, hitting his chin with a stone. Uh, the memory of the accident had faded from his mind, but he remembered well that for another year he could have not eaten anything more solid than overcooked porridge. Now he had a scar of his jaw and a loving of soup. But here was it. Of course, it was like soup. What else was it supposed to be like? So he drank beer, ate ugali, and slowly composed himself to ask the old man if he might stay with him during the rainy season. The main hut was very small, but he thought he could build a roof for himself on the outside of one of the walls. He realized he smelled of chickens and sweat, it was really dirty and he wanted to go and wash and sleep, but before that he also wanted to ask about this one thing. And the beer was good. Um, so he sat, drank, ate, listened to the old man's stories, and thought about a good way to make a request. He was almost ready when suddenly, suddenly the old man paused for a moment, smiled, asked rationally, and whispered. Do you know that this old war started because of me? What? No, I thought that maybe he did not understand. I was one. I was the one who started the war. The man proudly poked his finger at his bare, dry chest. Not fault of my own, of course, but it was me. How is that possible? And so the old guy told him. Once upon a time, a cow ran away from a Gaeshi peasant's enclosure. This Gaeshi looked for her, for the cow, for several weeks unsuccessfully until finally he heard that the cow looking exactly like the one he lost was seen in the village of Pielmi on the other side of the second street, the village. In two weeks, that is, he came there, he looked around and indeed his cow was there. Why didn't the finder come at him? Well, because he was dim. The finder was this guy, Hello, and the old warrior. Not an old then though, um, and more wealthy right than now. He had a second cow and even a young bull which he planned to sell. Well, whatever. 
Um, he indeed asked people if someone had lost a cow, but he only asked about other Kilby. Okay. And they also asked other Kilby. No one thought to go to the old Baoba, but there is the Gaeshi village on the other side of the second street. So, this Gaeshi goes to Halawa and says, Give me back the cow. And Halawa ran at him with an axe. Gaeshi escaped and complained about that to Natana. Well, was it Natana or was it his father in the farewell of the son? Well, it doesn't matter. Whoever it was, he sent a messenger to the thief, uh, to the chief of the two pigs. And this messenger ran back and forth several times until he finally brought the order that the elders of both villages, two pigs, and old Baba, I mean, uh, should gather and settle the matter. Well, the others gathered, elders gathered and agreed that the cow should be returned to the owner and that the milk and cow dung that Haloa used uh, was enough to pay for the care of the cow. Why so little? Well, because he was stupid and didn't think that the cow might belong to a geishi. The old Haloa, not so old then, um, got angry and shouted that if he had known it was a geishi cow, he wouldn't have taken the stray to his barn, but the jack let the jackals uh, eat her. And again, and again they both, that is the owner and Haloa, they almost jumped at each other on the spot, in the presence of the other. But they were both restrained. Not a year passed, and this time it would happen to that Haloa was walk walking through the old cow park. He looked around, and there it was, the cow that he had found, and a calf with a coating patch to patch, just like his own bull. Without thinking much, Haloa complained to the chief of the Gaishi village. Not only did he not get anything as a reward for saving someone else's cow, but the owner now has a healthy cow for free and a cow that gives milk twice a day, a justice. The Gaishi chief, however, laughed at him and did not want to hear a word about that again. After all, Haloa wasn't able to prove that it was his bull whom, which impregnated the cow. Maybe another bull did it shortly after that event. Or maybe the cow had been pregnant before Haloa left with nothing. And quickly, without making a scene in the village, uh, the enemy was uh, not necessarily the best idea. So, when, the, when he returned to, to fix Haloa, he told his friends about the incident and returned to the old Baoba at night to get justice. Initially, they only wanted to take the calf and thought that everything should have ended there. However, they were discovered in the middle of the theft and a fight started in which the Gaeshi, the owner of the cow, died. The next day, the old Baoba went to battle against the two pigs. They faced each other in the field, peasants from both villages, some with spears, some, some with axes, one even with a shield. But uh, most only had clubs and knives, and they stood and waited, everyone actually afraid to begin a fight. And then, just like that, suddenly there was a terrible hustle and bustle from the side of the road. They look, and there comes a Tilby army, King Glory's army countless maps, maybe even a dozen of dozen of warriors. And the guy should run away immediately, leaving only dust behind them. And that is how the war started. A war because of a cow. The old warrior finished and loved the, uh, loved the husky love of an old man who had spent his life inhaling the smoke of the fire way too often. He was laughing really long as if he had not, if, as if he had told a great joke and Noah had to restrain himself from smashing the board on his stupid head. You think this is funny? Noah shouted, his eyes darkened. You think you're allowed to make up stories by the fire on how your cow caused the greatest war in our history? Oh, ho, ho, great joke, a war because of a cow. 
Do you know how many people died? How many battles we have faced uh, against people who had been our neighbors just months before? And now we were ready to kill us just as we were as ready to kill them? How many of our comrades, friends, died in our arms? How many villages we were forcibly dropped into the army only to watch how they were being stabbed by spear a few days later? How many villages? He really left. He realized that he was screaming. He clenched his teeth. He breathed loudly through his nose like an angry bull. How many villages we... The old man did not understand. Noyak wanted to hit him. Wanted to wipe that stupid smirk off the face with punches. Knock out all the teeth the old warrior still had in his mouth. Some of his thoughts must have been evident in his face for Kalawa jerked away from his sharply and came sharply and tucked his knees under the, his dry chest as if that would protect him in any way. But the rage had already departed from Noah's soul fire. He lowered his hands, reached for his bundle, turned and walked away without, without a word. He went through the village and then further west. Only much later, at the crossroads, did he realize that he had to make a decision. It was the middle of the night, the rains could come at any moment, and he was at the foot of the mountain range, away from human, human habitation, tired and dirty. The road to the right led to the farewell of the sun, but he didn't want to go there. It was a Gaishi village, after all. Uh, mountains rose in front of him and also to his left. The road that led there now narrowed into a path, climbing and winding across the hill. He knew that its branches led to heavy settlements high in the mountain, even smaller and poorer, poorer than here. But he turned that way. He said it was still pleasantly pleasant with here, walking as lo he walked as long as he had the strength to and then collapsed into the bushes and fell asleep. Yeah, I, I didn't use any specific tools, but I think like the whole idea, like a, 
a way of working with a bigger project. Um, Do you just use the Kickstarter text and nothing else? Or? Uh, Google Docs. Use Google Docs. <laughs> okay, that was basically the question that I was done, but I think that answers my question. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, so the story is that um, it starts with a war in the you know, between those two tribes, uh, a war that is the biggest of the in the in the history they they remember, and um, it ends well, like the, the novel starts with the end of that war, but it became it becomes evident that both kings are plotting. Um, like um, I'm intrigued to actually not end this war at this point. Uh, both of them want to kill the other guy, and um, it uh, kind of turns out for one of them, but he, uh, but not exactly as he thought it uh, it would go. And um, one of the tribes, the guy she, uh, he win over the whole village, and the other uh, the other king is killed. And in the other tribe, the TLV, are um, going to be uh, well slaves of the of the first. <laughs> uh, although this is anachronistic because they don't have iron, so there are no slaves. <laughs> um, basically, uh, they still live in there, just as in the scene here. They still live in their villages, but are very poor. Like all the uh, most most of the of the crops are taken away from them. Um, and uh, and they, they need to be like a second class citizens in, in the village system. And the rest of the story takes place uh, 16 to 17 years later when an uprising starts. And um, there is like a, uh, on one end of the, bill, of the valley, um, some of my uh, characters uh, kill a few soldiers. And then they have to run away into the mountains, and then they um, discover remnants of the of that old civilization. And on the other end of the village, um, there is like a big group of, uh, of TLV uh, who are um, uh, who are taken away from their home. They have to run away from the king who wants to give their lands to uh, to his own tribe. And uh, those um, uh, th those uh, all the warriors and uh, and the young uh, men are gathered on the high highest mountain in the in the valley uh, called the tip of the spear there on, in the in, in the corner. And uh, the story is about how they both both those groups connect and uh, figure out how to deal with this, how to try to win another uprising. But they both have different ideas. Some of them want to just have uh, peace with the other tribe, but there's also quite a lot of hate and a lot of need for revenge. Because um, I think, uh, especially in, in like in many novels, especially young adult novels, there is this naive idea that it's enough if we just if, uh, if the characters just realize that it's, there's no point in fighting them, should not be and so on. But that doesn't work in reality, and I think like this, um, that the, the need for justice, the need for revenge is strong, and I also wanted to write how this can lead to like a circle of violence where just one uh, tribe becomes the oppressor of the other, and the rules can be revenged. So like actually stopping the whole thing in the middle in balance is way harder than allowing it to just go over there. Um, yeah, so as, a, as I said before, uh, I have about <laughs> 400 pages. Um, for, the, for the timeline, I, was, I started in the 19, and then uh, to 20, I was going like, writing quite a bit. Uh, back then, I thought it would be 270, maybe. Um, then in 2021, uh, I had a crisis, and um, also I started to do the programming videos. So I so there was a, a longer break, and uh, at the end of, tw of the 21, I came back to this more like with, with new ideas, and basically uh, I wrote the other half of the book in the last few months. Um, yeah, so now 
practice in editing, which means I'm going to like making making notes and then going to those notes and making changes. Um, then when I I hope in October maybe I will finish it. Uh, I will send it to some people to uh, for them to, to read it and give me some feedback. And uh, maybe I will make some changes based on those on that feedback. Uh, also, I'm trying to make it so that uh, because now um, um, more and more books are released as audiobooks, so I, I want to that the whole story is written in a way that you can, you can imagine it as a story told or, uh, on, around the fireplace. And uh, so I want it to be uh, it to be easy to uh, to tell for an audiobook, uh, and that also like, goes into like, this editing, like mm, also the part of it is reading it aloud. And, mm, okay, so if I change it, then maybe it will be easier. It's more like I can it to someone. Um, and then, in, like in December, maybe I will start to look for a uh, publisher. And that can take probably about a year. Uh, and I think that that could be a good deadline if in 2023 I won't find a publisher, then I will probably decide that, okay, I should, maybe I can translate it to English and look for an English publisher instead of a publisher. Get a board game or a mobile game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Role play, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I try to make, I try to make it realistic. So I uh, I, I, I read a lot. Uh, this is one one very important book, uh, The Dome of Everything, um, by David Greber and David uh, Wanko. One of them is an anthropologist. The other is an archaeologist. By, uh, but I don't remember anymore which one is which one. Um, and uh, they wrote a lot about that. Because we, uh, that the, the societies of the past are much more uh, diverse than we than we thought. That we have, we can find evidence in the archaeological records that we have republics, democracies, some kind of an anarchistic societies all over the world in the prehistory. Even though we usually think that that democracy is something new, and that's completely not not really uh, how it works because how we model our society, how we think, how we can live together is completely not connected to the technological level. We can have all those ideas even in uh, So in my story, I also, and sometimes my characters talk about like, human rights or something like this, and I wanted to have a backup that this is not anachronistic, this is in the book. Also, uh, Primitive Technology by John Plant. Uh, he's more known from, uh, uh, because of his uh, channel in YouTube, where he uh, tries to reconstruct um, uh, like Neolithic technology by himself. He's living somewhere in Australia and uh, has a patch of land and like, like he digs himself uh, in, in a cottage. He made uh, stone tools and so on, and he wrote about this is also like connected to this my idea that no matter where in the world we are, uh, the technology level of that Neolithic period should be similar everywhere. Um, there's also Stefan, yes, you see, his name is difficult. Uh, Stefan Milosavljevic, uh, he's a YouTuber and he makes a lot of uh, archaeology videos also about archaeology of Africa, which is kind of rare, and uh, and he mm, like those videos are really good if you want to learn something about archaeology, uh, check him out. And Ettore Matza is the author of the of the graphics also on the Stefan um, channel and the the two that I showed you during this talk, um, and. Yeah. If you want to know more about like yeah. history, prehistory of Africa, uh, BBC News Africa has documentaries about it. Uh, Deutsche Welle documentary also. Some of them because today it does uh, documentaries about all the world, but quite a bit about Africa as well. The problem is um, in our media we often 
think of Africa as one big country. So, for example, if, uh, if you want to learn something about traditional religions in uh, Great Lakes, then you have, well, uh, good luck, but uh, probably you will uh, have more, uh, more luck to find like a documentary about traditional religions in everywhere in Africa, and there will be a segment about the Great Lakes somewhere there. Um, also, if you want to, uh, to read more about the brewing in the prehistory, then Marin, uh, Marin Dinele uh, runs a Twitter account, and there, there, he, there, um, he has a lot of links. Um, he's a archaeologist, he has a lot, a lot of links to articles and uh, podcasts. He is a big proponent of that. It was actually first beer and only then bread, not the other way around. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, if you are, if you ever go to uh, Kigali, to Rwanda, then uh, try to get to Kweza Craft Brewery. It's a small craft beer brewery. Women brew, women learn, women everything. So, Where it used yeah. to be. Yeah. 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 And uh, <laughs> that's 